Hello and welcome to Global Sanctuary for Elephants podcast, Global Rumblings. Global Sanctuary for Elephants, or GSE for short, is a non-profit organization with a mission to create vast safe spaces for captive elephants where they are able to heal physically and emotionally, often from very traumatic pasts. I'm your host, Nadia Mari, and I'll be taking you to the lush jungle of the Mato Grosso region in central Brazil, home of GSE's initial project, Elephant Sanctuary Brazil currently home to five female Asian elephants, lovingly referred to as the girls. Hi everyone, welcome back and thank you for tuning in again this week for a new episode of Global Rumblings. In today's podcast, we'll be talking about Pocha, the sanctuary's eighth elephant. So let's head over to Brazil to say hi to Kat and Scott. Hi you two, how was your morning? Hey Nadia. Hey Nadia, you're doing well, how are you doing? I'm fine. You sound a bit tired, but we are recording a little bit earlier today, so it's pre-lunch. So thank you for uh, for doing that. Um, yeah, Pocha, your eighth elephant, together with Guzhamina, her daughter, elephant number nine. Kat mentioned in a recent episode that Pocha is ex-circus. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about her prior to her life with you at the sanctuary. Yeah, you know, honestly, I always get her story confused because I think we heard different things early on, and I don't really know. I don't remember. Um, I was just asking Kat about that, and she doesn't recall specifically either. I think there were two stories. One, that she was on circus for a short time because she had been at the zoo the majority of her life, Mm -hmm. um, and then went to the circuit and went to the zoo the other story was that she went directly to the zoo but i think she came in likely with the intention of being circus or was in circus for a short time and then went to the zoo but honestly i don't fully recall you know a lot of times we've actually had this conversation a little while ago with some of the caregivers where they said you know if we understood their past more then maybe we can understand more of where why they are how they are Mm. and i've always looked at it differently it doesn't really matter how they got here Mm. you know it's that they are here now and, you know, just because you know the past of all of them, whether it be circus or zoo, doesn't mean they're going to be expressing a certain type of process of recovery. That's mm. going to be individual. And that's mm. not about their past, it's about their individual journey. And some with more trauma may actually have an easier time adjusting, it depends on the individual. So knowing exactly that journey. And I honestly don't always follow that. Sure. I mm. mean, it just creates labels that you know, we're supposed to be forgetting all about at Sanctuary. So when did you first hear about Pocha? She's part of the, or she was named uh, part of the group, the Mendoza Four, the other three elephants being Kenya, the female African, uh, Tammy, the father of Gujamina, and then Gujamina. So when did you first hear about these four elephants? I think it was in 2016 was the first time we were contacted about them. Alejandra from Foundation Friends Weber was in contact with us and she had been talking to both the primary zoos in Argentina, uh, Mendoza and Buenos Aires, and they had been working towards, you know, this idea of transforming the the zoo into eco parks. And a big part of that was sending elephants internationally or animals internationally to suitable sanctuaries. Uh, Mm. And I think it was in 2016 was the first time I went there. I don't recall. I know you're not asking me about dates. And (laughs) it was it was a kind of a whirlwind trip when we first saw uh, Mara, saw Pelusa. And at the same time, went down to uh, Mendoza to visit with those elephants a little bit. And both all of those were really, really short trips. Um, I don't recall a whole lot from them aside from being appalled by their living conditions. The I remember Mariana, the zoo director, saying she had never heard them vocalize before when you were there and you had given them brows and they started making what we grew to know as their typical noises. But she was surprised because mm-hmm. she said she never heard them make any noises. Yeah, which mm. is actually shocking for knowing how vocal they are. They had to be. They didn't just start that day. Um, you know, at the moment we thought, well, it's interesting that they vocalized that way and never heard it before. But there's no way they started that type of vocalization on that day. But that was simply starting with 
seeing their sterility of their world and wanting to do something different and saying, you know, there's some broken branches from a, a windstorm. Like, can we just give them those branches? And they authorized it and the elephants were overjoyed. Um, and I think it was at that point, almost any opportunity to celebrate anything different to break up the monotony. Mm. I must say that in the, um, in the episode where we talked about Guizhabina's um, recovery story, um, when we took a little short detour, that statement you made about you wondering what faces or what imaginary friends Guiji might have left behind in the cement pit that she called her home, I must say that that really that really haunted me for a few days because it just sort of made me realize, you know, the psychological damage, what coping mechanisms she must have had. But then, of course, also Pocha, who was then on her own for 24 years before Guijamina was born. So after you got to know Pocha and then the other three elephants at the, at the zoo, how did then the the rescue or the, the, the journey of you trying to bring them to sanctuary, how did that um, progress or how did that start? I'm just going to step back for a half a second um, because one of the things is when we saw it was after we started having conversations about bringing them here and looking into anything we could find online. And I found a couple of videos on YouTube of Pocha before she had Gijamina. And mm. she was so angry. She was throwing anything she could throw at the people around her exhibit. She was running and throwing her trunk up. I mean, it wasn't just this passive throwing things, which they actually did when we had arrived, but it was interesting to see how much she mellowed, most likely probably out of necessity, after she had Gijamina. Um, mm. Yeah, and I think before she had Gijamina, she was with Tammy more, uh, my understanding anyway, that they had that whole space. So, she, you know, Tammy and, and Pocha were together for some time. Wasn't there something about her having a stillborn at one point too? Wasn't there? I don't remember. I don't remember that, thought there was something about that. But anyway, yeah, she was very different elephant for some time. And then when we saw her, of course, that was mostly a political trip. You know, just to see what's going on, meet the people involved, you know. And mm. then Kat went back a few years later, maybe a year later. That's when you guys spent more time with Dr. Rinku Gohain. And Kat got to dive a little bit deeper into their care uh, at mm -hmm. all three facilities, spending, uh, I think, two or three days there each at each facility. Yeah, we spent more time at with Pelusa, but Pelusa oh, was me. the one who was physically... A, I mean, she was a disaster. So there was a lot of trying to figure out if there was anything we could do to help her, if she was too far gone, what was actually wrong with her, so on and so forth. So the main focus of the trip was her, but since we were there, we stopped to see. Well, we only saw Mara. She was the only one outside of Buenos Aires. And then we saw the elephants in Mendoza. And I think also we had, Kenya with, had that tusk infection at the time. Yeah. So that was part of it also. Mm -hmm. But I think that during that time, you guys, you got to see a little bit more what their schedule is because we had heard, I had heard about, you know, what their schedule was there, which was, you know, after 11 o'clock in the afternoon, no one's there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how mm -hmm. can that be true? That doesn't really make sense. And that their feeding regimen was one time a day. And we had immediately tried to change their diet, which didn't work really well. Uh, make additional recommendations again, which didn't work really well. Um, <laughs> and then when Kat and Dr. Gohain were there, they tried to reinforce that not only from dietary perspective, but also behavioral perspective, and then also with medical, with Kenya, um, all of which was just amazing how inappropriate on all levels. Um, but they had motivation to try to change. Yep. And we started moving forward and started trying to put the pieces in place. And a lot of that time was for us, we still needed to work on permits. We had to get development, the same old story. And mm. then we could only, you know, it can't all happen at the same time. So we could only mm. start on their importation permits after we had already got the importation permit and importation of Mara. Um, and then because of the licensing here, how many elephants we could receive. Um, so all of that was dependent on the next step. And then of course, as we already talked about with Mara's transfer being delayed because of, because of COVID, you know, mm. and then when she came and then allowing all those, all those issues that came up. But there was a lot going on in the meanwhile. I mean, we were, 
paying trainers to go and work with them because of the importation requirements, uh, the sanitary requirements. They had to be able to get injections and have blood tests done and other treatments. So they had no training and it was really difficult to train them. One, because there was no safe way to do it initially. We had to have them build training walls and knock out walls to do so. And I mean, getting all of that done and designed is such a process. It's not like we make recommendations and those happen in a week. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. we make recommendations. They come back and tell us why they can't do it. We make more recommendations. We still get mostly no's and then it takes six months to get anything done. So I know people have a hard time understanding why certain things take so long. Um, and don't get me wrong. I think we did too initially, but you learn that it's not just one group or one organization or one facility that is like this, that, it is how things go here and you adjust, but they had to build the training walls first. And we actually had the first trainer show up when they told us the training walls were done and they weren't done. And it was really difficult to train them because they did Mm -hmm. not want to leave each other's side initially. And you can't, it doesn't really work to train two elephants side by side, especially with Gijamina being dominant over her mother. And anytime Mm -hmm. her mom gets something good, you know, they're smart enough to know that when they hear the whistle in the bridge that that means they did something right and a reward is coming and it's easy enough for her to just bump her mother off her spot and take her reward. (laughs) So they had to work first on just even separating the two of them for any length of time, which required training them to go one to go underneath and one to stay up top. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a simple process essentially in any way, even aside from all of the issues with the permits. I mean, Carissa went back, she was the person who was doing training And she went back three or four times probably. And each time she was there for six, eight, 12 weeks. And she's a great trainer. And she had a really hard time getting some of the behaviors with them because of the dynamics there. Mm. The facility is incredibly limited. You know, as Kat already said with even building a training wall, but okay, so they, they have the one training wall, but then how do you call another elephant to the side? You know, the only way to call them to the side is to work from above them because they're in a oh, concrete okay. pit. And of course, mm. working above an elephant who can possibly grab your ankles doesn't work very well because we don't want people getting grabbed and pulled into this concrete pit with them. And so much of that training depends on observation of behavior, but how do you observe their behavior and their facial expressions when you're above them? <laughs> you know, so, yeah, you and to them, get yeah. close enough to the edge, then you have the risk factor. So this, you know, this kind of snowball of elements and that they also, that stupid gate, you know, that they were supposed to fix but couldn't fix because if they tried to fix it, the elephants would just push it open and break it again. So trying to find a different way. The only way this gate would open and close was that somebody would go unlock it from the backside and the elephants would push it open. But they had to move out of the way quickly because the elephants were actually trained to open up the gate because nobody, no no human could open up the gate because it was broken. And only the elephants had force. So they actually trained the elephants to slam the gate open. But to do that, you had to pull the pin and run, which made it really dangerous for anybody in there. Uh, you oh know, gosh. you're in a separate enclosure. You're not in, in a separate space, but the way the gate is sliding towards you created danger, and it's a little tiny hole of a of a of an operating room. Uh, so, so many dynamics that were. Yeah, and I mean, we usually only send one trainer because it's usually just one elephant, and yeah. we had sent her, and there were translators. But the problem was, you had to have somebody with an awareness that was with the other elephant and it didn't really work super well. So it ended up, we had to send two trainers um, or at least one trainer and a support trainer. And with all of this, you know, you're still talking about still a fairly new organization. We're not a gigantic organization with a huge budget and we're having to pay four salaries for months for two trainers, housing in Argentina, getting them back and forth, food, you know, there's all these expenses we have to cover. And even with all the time that they were spending there, progress was so slow. Progress is actually great with Kenya because while Mm. they were there, they were working with her to present her trunk so they could treat her trunk because she's had this issue for a really long time. And every time it popped up, the zoo wasn't able to do anything with her as far as touching, cleaning, medicating. So they were just giving her antibiotics every time it happened. So when they did actually were able to culture it, it was resistant to every antibiotic except for one. Um, 
which isn't one you would generally want to use in an elephant. So Carissa was working with Kenya to train her to be able to clean her tusk and then was starting with foot presentations so they could start basic footwork. And she was actually amazing. I mean, perfect student, really, really, really responsive. More access to her. Sure. You know, so mm-hmm. not in a pit, you can see her more solitary elephant. Yeah. So she's going to be more, you know, uh, more singularly focused. Yep. Uh, but that whole first trip, I think ended up being only Kenya with only a, middle, a little bit for Gijamina because the whole training wall wasn't ready, <laughs> you know, so uh, ended up being complicated set of circumstances. Uh, but through that time, bringing it back to Pocha, you know, there was always, it was interesting to start watching that dynamic between them mm-hmm. and how are we going to separate them? How is this going to work? Because Gija was very controlling. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes with their behavior with both of them, I remember, I don't remember if it was only poetry or if it was both, that sometimes they would not even come get down to the training room yeah. for three or four days. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so there's this fear in both of them. And for those that remember once they got here, you know, for those that have already know, know the next steps, you know, it took them a little while to build that trust. But if you go back mm-hmm. in time, even in the facility they had lived in for years and years and years, they still had that same sort of cycle where they would kind of get stuck, you know, emotionally or psychologically stuck in, a, in, a, in an area where they you know, don't want to go down through the corridor, you know, mm. and, you know, is it a, a boogeyman under the bed or, you know, what is that fear? Because it didn't really seem like it was logical sometimes. It wasn't mm. always weather related. It wasn't food related. Um, it wasn't after something bad happened or after something good happened. It just wasn't, seemed random. wasn't training induced. You know, it wasn't anything like that. It wasn't even, you know, after an attempt to separate them a little bit, there was no connection between any of these, you know, with connecting the dots were what, what was the trigger. So I had a lot of psychological issues that they were trying to analyze and trying to figure out and, and then trying to think of the next step of that was going to be not only for the training, what's going to happen in transport. Hmm. Because How do you separate two elephants who have never been more than, you know, 10 yards apart from each other, essentially? Mm-hmm. I mean, they had mm-hmm. never been split before they started yeah. training them to at least split into different parts of their tiny little enclosure. But now you're talking about walking into different crates, being closed out from each other, and then being on the road for five days. A lot of challenges. Yeah, a lot of challenges. Was that very new for you, not only for GSE, but from Tennessee as well, working with two elephants at the same time. Was that a challenge or very new for you? Yeah, and Tanji and Zula came yeah. at the same time from Tennessee. Yeah, and their training was done, you know, without, you know, with the team that was actually at the zoo. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of who else came. Oh, we had the circus elephants, but those were all different all also. All of the Hawthorne elephants, you know, but they were on chains. And, yeah. You know, those relationships okay. were very different. And we've said it before, you know, we, we've seen all the, you know, the, the, the promos of, you know, the world's loneliest elephant or the world's most isolated elephant and all these different things. And, you know, the world's most neglected elephant that some of these, you know, the, the rescues, you know, put on, on labels, label these elephants to try to attract attention to gain support for the rescue, not necessarily with these two. But when we see all of those, I think it's rare that we've seen, if ever, two elephants that were more... I'm gonna say isolated because mm. of the because of their enclosure, because of how that enclosure was constructed and how how sheltered they were from the outside world. And that caused a lot of a lot of challenges throughout all of this. You know, mm. and then through that also as we started as when Carissa was there sometimes, you know, we'd see something in a photo and I remember Kat asking about Pocha, just she seems not well. You know, and I would have returned back saying, yeah, she, she looks, everything's fine. She's eating fine. Her food, species, species look good, but, you know, her stools look good. But there seems like there was something not right with her. Her eyes just didn't look like a healthy elephant. Yeah, I mean, and we didn't know her well enough to know definitively if that was the case. I mean, all we knew was, you know, looking at a photo where she's cute and lovely, but her face just mm. kind of said... I don't feel good. She doesn't feel good. And that's part of looking at so many elephants for so long, you know, and part of what we, we really tried to focus on with the, the care, caregivers here and in Tennessee also was really starting to see the differences in them. You're not just looking at an elephant. And you're looking at an mm-hmm. individual that has a lot of ways of communicating, a lot of ways of expressing something that may not be right. And since we don't mm-hmm. have diagnostic tools, we've talked about it before, to determine exactly what's going on. Oh, we have some. We're just very limited. Very limited. <laughs> you know, so it's 
you rely on that observation. Mm-hmm. You know, mm. they just look different. Something doesn't seem right. Her head seems lower. You know, she's standing a little bit different. Her, you know, belly looks a little bloated. And sometimes it's really subtle. And this look in her eye was pretty striking, but also none. Not definitive. You can't tell what's going on just by looking at their face. No, but you can see the people right. that are spending every day with her say, no, she looks like that normal. She's fine. I mean, there's not much yeah. you can do to argue about it. But along those lines, same lines, we had an elephant in Tennessee who Scott, myself, and another caregiver had known for years at that point, and she just seemed different. She seemed off. You know, we all felt the same way. You know, there's something going on. She was still venturing out in the habitat she was still social still vocal still eating you know nothing significant so talked Mm. to the vet team they told us do blood work blah 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 we did all that all of that looks fine you know we're like she still doesn't seem okay to us you know and they're like she's fine and then another elephant tara who generally was always wandering around and she would stay for a couple of days and then leave and so on and so forth she came and she didn't leave in her normal time frame. And we're like, no, okay. She knows there's something wrong. We know there's something Mm. wrong. How, you know, again, with limited diagnostics, there's nothing we can show for what we're feeling. But she ended up going down a week after we started the conversation about her Mm. not being normal. And then she passed away a couple of days later. I mean, sometimes medical tests, again, because of limitations, they don't, paint any sort of picture but if you really know your elephant you know Mm. you know when something's not right you just can't always know what it is well unfortunately your your observations and that your feeling and your inkling that something wasn't quite right then obviously five months after pocha did arrive at the sanctuary and she passed away um obviously were um yeah were correct but we're we're jumping ahead a lot maybe going back well like in the intro i said we're talking about pocha well but you can't really talk about pocha without gujramina and then you're saying you couldn't really train one without the other so uh, yeah we're talking about both elephants at the same time we're we're coming to the end of our of our recording today unfortunately so maybe we can just sort of yeah wrap up how, how how long did the, the did the training roughly take? Because it was it's all happening at the same time. You, you'd you'd rescued Mara. Mara was ill. Then uh, Scott was off rescuing Bambi. But at the same time, you are um, already in investing time and money into um, yeah Pocha and Guijamina to get them them across as well to to the sanctuary. And then there's the other tangent in all of that, which was the importation permits, which were delayed because of the people in Argentina not wanting the elephants to let go of Ar- leave Argentina. Oh, yeah. And well, part of that well, goes yeah. back to, you know, no one really cares about these elephants for years and years and years. And then, uh, wait a minute, you find out that they're going somewhere good and you don't want them to go there because you want to keep them for yourself. And that yeah. caused mm. a whole other issue with crazy accusations and false accusations and claims and inspections and more inspections and... Yeah, so none of these are straightforward processes. Yeah. You know, I think sometimes we, we talked about it before. Sometimes people want to think that, you know, you learn about an elephant, you come up with an agreement, everyone's on the same page, let's make it happen. But yeah. it's very rare that simple. Really, it is rarely that is that simple. And I think a lot of people are used to rescues where the elephants are in the same country. You know, mm-hmm. you see rescues yeah. in Asia where they are in Thailand already and brought sanctuaries in Thailand and in India where they're in India already and brought sanctuaries there. I mean, if they were trying to cross elephants over into other countries, it's a whole different thing, like we saw with Kavan. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's definitely not the same level of complication when the elephants are already in your country because we've had, you know, rescues within the country that happened almost essentially within weeks. But mm-hmm. whenever you get CITES and all of that good stuff involved, it becomes a very different. It's much more diplomatic, it's much more bureaucratic, yeah. it's much more political. Yeah. And also there's time frames to keep in mind. So as soon as the permits run out because something has happened with the zoo, then you have to reapply for all the permits. And yes, well, we talked about it a lot with other rescues. It's yeah. the Vogons, but uh, lots, of, mm-hmm. lots of wasted time, lots of stamping of, of permits, everyone wanting to say something. But then also, unfortunately, as you just uh, briefly mentioned, that the political aspect of then suddenly the country not wanting to let go of an elephant or of elephants that they had neglected for years. Mm. Mm, so maybe next time we can we can then pick up and um, 
yeah, then you continue telling us how the, how the training went, because it was successful, of course, because Pocha Gujamina did arrive at the sanctuary. So I'll let you go and have lunch. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Very tasty lunch. And uh, yeah, thanks for your time. And then we'll, we'll catch up again in two weeks' time for our recording. Thank you again, Nadia. It's always a pleasure. Bye, Nadia. Bye. That's all that we have time for this week. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. And if you did, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode. Another great zero-cost way to support us is by leaving a five-star rating or a glowing review, as this helps other people discover the podcast. Thank you so much, and until we meet up in two weeks' time, take care. Oh, 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 oh.